Oh, cool. If Christ had that much gold to make the rocks, he wouldn't need to feed the poor. Ma'am? If Christ had that much gold to make a big cross, he probably needs to feed the poor. <laughs> probably. Right, I've heard that argument a lot. Like the Vatican could do, do a lot of good by selling the, you know, the Vatican City. Or us in and of itself, right? You know, it's not necessarily the wealth and thing is wrong. The, the making of a talisman is something to make something as a means of representing God um, is not something I think our Lord would do, right? As you shall not make for yourself a graven image. Uh, anyway, he makes this giant golden cross. He makes it and bedecks it in jewels and everything. And, and just like the Lord said, what can you make for me that would be representative of my glory and my God? Like, what could we make with our own hands? These are dumb things that we can fashion with our own hands. You really think, just like even from the Ark of the, Ark, Ark of the Covenant, uh, from the very beginning, this is not some weapon of war that they would try to use. It was something that represented God's place, that God had ordained it to be, but not because it was uh, some special thing, but he was picturing it of the holy temple ultimately, right? So no, this is not something I think our Lord would do, but whatever the case may be, uh, he defeats Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge, um, and he immediately declared his conversion to Christianity. Uh, at least the record says this. There are some records that say he was baptized on his deathbed. This is where it gets kind of fuzzy. So he claims his uh, conversion to Christianity. He establishes this, saying this is um, pretty much who I am and where we're going to go from here. And within a year, he issues what's known as the Edict of Toleration, or the Edict of Milan in 313 A.D. This was huge. This was huge. This was a big turning point in history. There are some dates that are probably good to know throughout history, just as a big thing, from 586 B.C., the deportation to uh, the exile to Babylon, A.D. 70, the destruction of Jerusalem, 325, the Council of Nicaea. This is probably a big one, too, 313, with the Edict of Toleration, which is instantly and suddenly... Um, Christians suddenly had a favored status. They went from the catacombs to the halls of emperors, and the turning of a year is, is very quick. This edict favored Christians at court. It exempted Christian ministers from taxes. It issued a general exhortation to all the subjects to become Christian, which is actually interesting. I, this is something I learned when I was studying this. Constantine did not establish Christianity as a state religion. That's a common misconception. It was actually three emperors later, Theodosius I, who stamped it and said, this is the state religion of the Empire of Rome. It's a very big difference, and we're going to talk about this in some of our application. But Constantine just issued a general proclamation said, all of you should be Christian. But he very clearly favored Christians. He had people in his court that he could choose were all Christians. And so it became very expedient to be a Christian all of a sudden, right? He ceased the gladiatorial fights. He reduced the killing of unwelcome children. Think about that as the application today. He abolished crucifixion as a form of execution, repealed the persecution edicts of Diocletian. He assumed the headship of the church and advanced Christians to high offices. He declared Sunday a day of worship and forbade work on Sunday, which was a huge deal for slaves. Now, whether he did this because it was a Christian thing or because there are actually three major religions in the empire at this time, they're all sun worshipers. They're pagan, pagan worshipers, but they all worshiped on Sunday. And it could have been that he saw this as a great opportunity to bring all of them together. Constantine was obsessed with unifying the empire to prevent it from fracturing and falling apart. That was what really seemed to drive everything he did, which hard to blame him. A massive Roman empire like that, but it was also falling apart, trying to find a way to unify all these competing philosophies and religions and everything else. I don't blame him, but whether he was genuine or not, it's not the point of this class, because I have no idea, and I don't think anybody really does have an idea. There are some things that point to maybe he was truly regenerate, maybe he did truly repent, and other things like how could a truly regenerate person towards the end of his life have his wife and son murdered because they were you know, accused of intrigue and trying to usurp him and all this kind of stuff, and he had him killed. Basically, his wife was accused his son of trying to seduce her and trying to do this thing. So he killed his son. He found out later it was a lie that his wife was manipulating, so he killed her too. And so all of this was murderous, deceptive. This guy was icky, all right? So whether that was true or not, is again, it's not the point. Maybe Constantine just said it best in his own words that I await the judgment of Jesus Christ, okay? Maybe that's the best we can do with trying to identify whether he was truly a believer or not. I don't know. But we're going to trace the, the fact of what he did in this era and how all this changed the world, really. Because um, do you like worshiping on Sunday without work? That's endured to this day. Um, that's amazing. That, that we find a lot of our roots here. He took a lot of things and changed them uh, in nomenclature only. So things that, um, such as Christmas, Easter, uh, things back then that were really in the Eastern side of the Roman Empire kind of had roots in Babylon uh, paganism and whatnot. 
Uh, we know that Christ probably was not born in winter, but we, he changed in nomenclature and sign the whole, some of the traditions we even see nowadays. I'm not trying to kill Christmas, don't get me wrong. But the burning of a Yule log and replacing it the next day with a trim Christmas tree, that was all fertility right based in all kinds of stuff in, in Babylon. The changing of um, the Passover and the Jewish kind of celebration in Easter changed in nomenclature and a lot of things too, to Easter as we know it and tied to bunny rabbits and all that stuff is kind of a modern iteration of pagan roots. So. I'm not making a big deal of all that, but just at least know where that kind of comes from. Um, one of Constantine's first acts upon ascending to the throne was to order 50 Bibles to be prepared for the instruction of the churches. These were the first Bibles uh, when, when containing all of the books of the New Testament as we have them today. Um, so these are huge change turning points in history, right? Uh, where do we get a lot of this? From Eusebius. Uh, Eusebius was um, from 264 to 340 AD. He lived through and was in prison during Diocletian's persecution. Uh, he became the Bishop of Caesarea and the church historian, and he was Constantine's chief religious advisor. Um, so Alex did a great job in the past couple of weeks setting the stage for all the heresies and all the things that arose during this time, because suddenly you have this massive Christianity's okay stamp, right? And it became very politically expedient. Everybody starts angling to be Christian so that they can gain political intrigue. and They have a whole push in that direction now. So the freedom of thought and discussion. The, the Christians ch exchanged the rags of the catacombs, which are still there today, of the persecution under the Diocletian. They put on the purple silk of the imperial courts, and they began to move in that direction. From that, discourse opened, and you get uh, heresies like Arianism, modalism, adoptionism, the things that uh, Alex has already brought up in the last uh, several weeks, and issued how in co the Council of Nicaea, which was called by Constantine in 325 with about 250 some odd bishops. It's an ecumenical council, a gathering of all church leaders to decide this issue. And they definitively declared no, Arianism is heresy. Do y'all remember pop quiz real quick? Arianism, modalism, who can judge? What's Arianism? Jesus is basically, yeah, a created being uh, in a sense. And modalism is similar, that uh, basically God appears in multiple modes. He's, he's one God, but he appears sometimes as Jesus and sometimes as God the Father, sometimes as the Spirit. That's a sort of a different way. It fails to address the uniqueness of Jesus, and the Son, and God the Father, but it also doesn't address the full trinity that God is both God, uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in three persons. Um, if we think this isn't applicable, in 2016, there is a survey of evangelicals, and 71% of evangelical Christians, we are evangelical Christians, agreed with this statement that, where is it? I want to read it to you so I don't misread it. Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. 71% of evangelicals in 2016 agreed to that statement. Have we ever dealt with that before in history? Did God create Jesus? That's the question. Thousands plus years ago, right? These things have been going on for a millennia and a half, and we're still battling with these ideas of did God create Jesus, or is Jesus actually God? And maybe there's some ignorance in this. People are like, oh, yeah, Jesus is great. He's the greatest and great, best and first and all that, and that's the extent of their thinking about it, maybe. I got it. Surveys, you know, 75% of all statistics are false, right? Um, <laughs> So maybe there's some of that, but it is still quite discouraging to me. We can't read a simple sentence like that and be like, Arianism, dude, we dealt with that in 325, right? And subsequent hundreds of years. But anyway, um, let me get back to where I was. I'm getting sidetracked. Nicaea in 325, uh, they dealt with this issue, but that did not ultimately destroy um, Arianism. Um, it still continued debates all the way to the end in 386 is after Constantine, and they had the, Con the Council of Constantinople where they were still addressing outworkings of all this. And it really became a problem even further and because Arius, it, it, con it confuses Constantine too as far as it, his legitimacy because Constantine ends up reestablishing Arius as a bishop again. And so you're like, what? You know, you decry him and then you reestablish him as a bishop. That kind of points to me his, his desire more for political peacekeeping than it was for actually establishing any kind of doctrine or clear thought on what the Bible actually teaches. All right? Um, so anyway, after the Council of Nicaea, 325 to 330-ish, Constantine is fed up with the Romans, uh, and the Romans primarily in the West, their addiction to paganism, their deeply rooted roots, and they were really fighting hard and trying to maintain a duality of sort of Christian paganism. And so he picks up and moves to Byzantine and calls it, stamps it, and said, this is now the capital of the Roman Empire. And he renames it after himself, Constantinople. And that effectively creates a first big schism, in a sense. There's, that's the split leg between the East and West Holy Roman Empire. Don't 
necessarily mess up that word schism. There's other implications in history for that. But So you have the Roman popes, not popes yet, but the Roman bishops. There are really four centers of Christianity in this time. Uh, I think it was um, kind of in Egypt and um, Turkey, as well as in uh, Palestine or Israel at that time, and then over in Rome in the West. All of them start aligning under Constantine, except for the West, and the Roman bishops begin to, sup- to just self-impose their supremacy. They say, we are the heads of the church. And there's this bickering back and forth, vying from power between East and West already from the beginning. And the, from the West, we begin to see the rise of their seeds and the roots that eventually led to the Roman Catholic papacy and their vie for temporal control. Constantine, in the middle of all this, was the first to take the title of Vicarius Christi, the Vicar of Christ. Have you ever heard that before? Where does that ever apply nowadays? Yeah, you can speak up. Is it the Pope, right? Uh, and it's, it's a little bit blended. It's not always the same throughout history about how it's used or the implications theologically, but Vicarius Christi, Latin, means the vicar of Christ. It's in Greek, it's anti-Christ, literally, which does not mean against, but it means in the place of. Vicarious, in the place of Christ. Essentially saying, I am standing in the place of Christ and representing him to God. If nothing else in this class should make you shudder, that should make you just shudder with the audacity to take on the role or the title of saying, I am in the way of Christ. Why is that such a big deal? The vicar of Christ, for me to stand up or a priest to stand up or anybody to say, I am acting in the place of Christ here in a sense that I am his represent, his head on earth. Where biblically, what biblically in your mind should pop right into your head? Ma'am? He is the head, right? To take that role and to take that stance is to say Christ is not sufficient. Christ died for me to access the Father through him. That's what Christ died for, not for some other guy, some other sinner to step in and say he is the one who intercedes for me on behalf of Christ. That's to step in front of him and to say, basically, Christ's death wasn't necessary, or it was necessary to accomplish to put me in his place. That's a terrifying thought, okay? But not only did Constantine take this title, the Vicarius Christi, the Vicar of Christ, which later the Pope stole and use it as their own kind of title to establish their dominance uh, on the region and, and ruling at that time, but he also took the title of Pontifex Maximus as another time. That was the pagan side of it. The Pontifex Maximus was the, basically the president of the college of the, the pagan uh, worshipers and uh, rulers at that time. He's like, I'm the Pontifex Maximus and I'm the Vicar of Christ. All of this together trying to establish himself as unifying all other religions, ecumenical, uh, pulling all these religions. They're all kind of one thing under me, in a sense. Um, so that's what he basically did. And so stop, stop for a minute and zoom out. We see Constantine and what he's been doing, but remember the fact that our war is not against flesh and blood. Right? And I'm kind of jumping to application here a little bit. Our war is against the spiritual principalities, against the spiritual influences of our enemy, Satan. We have an enemy who is trying to undo everything that the Lord has been doing. Uh, and the Lord is victorious. He has won. He is establishing his church. Nothing can thwart the Lord's plan. We know that. We believe that. And we see it throughout history that even though there have been emperor after emperor, diabolical scheme after diabolical scheme, attempting to stamp out Christianity, it's never succeeded. In fact, it's done quite the opposite because the Lord will establish his church and carry it on to the perfect fulfillment that he has intended. But look at our enemy. Know your enemy, Sun Tzu, right? Know your enemy or you'll suffer a lot more pain in your battles. Our enemy realized he could not abolish the church in the first couple hundred years. He tried to systematically wipe out the church through brute force, and it did nothing but expand it. And he's not an idiot. He twists tactics, and what he couldn't do through brute force he twists, he marries the church to the world, he invites intrigue into the world, and intrigue, pomp, the desire to rule, and all these things start getting blended in with the church, and he corrupts it from the inside. He takes the pain and the misery and the crucible of hardship, which purified the church, and then he allures the church with a sucker of worldliness, with comfort and ease and power and control. And through that, he opened the door through all kinds of heresies, even either through apostate believers or through plenty of unbelievers who are mixed in the church uh, with it. So continuing our historical lesson very quickly, or I'm now halfway through, and then I want to get to our application primarily. After Constantine, Julian, the, known as Julian the Apostate, he only lived a couple years. He tried to restore paganism. Very brief. They cut him off, said, nope, we're done with that. Jovian, 363 to 364, sought to restore Christianity. And then it was Theodosius I, 378 to 395. He's the one who actually made Christianity the state religion of Rome. He said, basically, in effect, Rome is now Christian. God is God, and we are his people. Okay? That's very important. 
Let me catch up here. Uh, the, he issued the Edict of Thessalonica on 27 February 8380, and that made Nicene Christianity the state church of the Roman Empire. It condemned other Christian creeds, such as Arianism, as heresies of, quote, foolish madmen, and authorized their punishment. Forced conversions filled the churches with unregenerate people. Ambition to rule, heathenism, and pomp emerged in the world's church. Basically, heathenism was Christianized. All right, pagan temples became Christian churches. Heathen festivals were converted into Christian ones. Pagan priests changed robes. Changed robes. You basically had a change in nomenclature with no real change in heart. So the marriage of Constantine was consummated in Theodosius I. Now we're going to fast forward and do a warp speed kind of view of where this kind of leads to. You've got the rise of the temporal power of the Romans and the papacy in Rome. Everybody still with me? I hope I'm not like wearing you out. I know this is a little bit dry. We'll get there. Um, and in the east, uh, we've got the rise of the eastern leg, which is where you get eventually Eastern Orthodox. So like, we will not, the eastern side, Constantine and his subsequent uh, followers say, we will not acknowledge Roman popes. They don't have supremacy, we do. So they don't acknowledge Roman popes, and you still see this today, Eastern, Ortho eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism in the West. Uh, the bishops of Rome began to vie for temporal con control, and very quickly in the divided empire, the Western Empire falls to the barbarians just in a few hundred years, 476 or so. The eastern side lasts another thousand years plus. All right, and they go all the way down until they eventually fell to, I believe it was the, um, uh, the Turks or the Muslims, basically, at that point in 1453 when the Eastern Empire fell. Um, so <coughs> to that point, uh, we're going to kind of trace how this goes down ultimately to see the popes as we see them now. Um, so from 612 to 618, the three Eastern centers, Christianity, Syria, Israel, and Egypt gave way to Islam, and Constantinople alone was left. Uh, Islam, in a sense, was kind of a revolt against the Christian idolatry of the world at that time. And that's how they kind of came, gave them their rise to power. And from the very first, the East failed and would not recognize the supremacy of uh, the Roman papal powers. Eventually, you get to this guy, Pepin. And if you remember from history, Pepin was the father of Charlemagne. And Pepin went in with the Pope, and the Pope at that, the Pope, he wasn't quite really the Pope yet, but the Bishop of Rome at that time was instrumental in the help of bringing him to power over the, as the Franks. The Franks gained notoriety and poverty, power, and the, uh, basically the bishop at that time asked him to come kick out the Lombards, which were ravaging Italy. This is around the early thousands, so about 800 years later or so from where we were just talking about. He did so, and this we have a big merging of temporal power with the soon-to-be papacy in Rome. He helped the pope, and the pope helped him. They backed each other up, and um, Pepin gave the pope a big swath of land in Italy to rule, essentially. That became the papal vassal states, which really existed for another 1,200 years or so uh, until a lot of that happened. The pope began to wear a crown and have actual imperial rule in that area. Charlemagne was Pepin's son. He was one of the greatest, uh, history, greatest leaders in history. He ruled for like 30, 40-something years. Uh, had many conquests. He's a pretty amazing guy, but he is the one who really is instrumental in establishing the papacy as a power. He gave them tremendous power through their mutual coexistence of building uh, the Franks and their whole domination of Europe and Italy from the south as well. That eventually, through multiple succession and some good, some bad, Gregory I and various <laughs> other popes who were actually really good about trying to establish certain things, um, but it eventually leads to this guy named Pope Innocent III. Uh, if you don't know a name in history uh, such as his, it's good to know his name. I'm just going to read this to you. Pope Innocent III was the pope uh, which eventually led to the Inquisition. All right? Innocent III was the most powerful of all the popes. He claimed to be the vicar of Christ. He's the first one to take that title from Constantine. Uh, the vicar of God, the supreme sovereign over the church and the world. All things on earth and in heaven and in hell are subject to the vicar of Christ. That's quote-unquote. The kings of Germany, France, England, and practically all the monarchs in Europe obeyed his will, including the Byzantine Empire. Never in history has any one man exerted more power. He ordered two crusades, decreed transubstantiation. That's the belief that the uh, blood and the wine actually turn to physical flesh and blood in your body uh, when you take it. It's a Roman Catholic doctrine still believed today. He confirmed auricular confession, which is the oral confession to a priest, saying that the priest has the authority to forgive sins on earth. That's this institution of going in the place of God. Uh, there's a, there are local leaders who would make this case today, and Alex and I have talked about this and read articles written by local people here who would say that the, the priest has that role and has that important feeling, and that it is a sacrament of their church to go and confess uh, in Roman Catholicism. Anyway, he uh, uh, back to Innocent III. He declared papal infallibility. 
He condemned the Magna Carta, forbade the reading of the Bible in the vernacular, instituted the Inquisition, and ordered the extermination of heretics, etc. More blood was shed under his direction and that of his immediate successors than in any other period of church history, except in the papacy's effort to crush the Reformation in the 16th and 17th centuries. The Inquisition, called the Holy Office, it was instituted by Pope Innocent III and perfected by Pope Gregory IX. Under it, everyone was required to inform against heretics. Anyone suspect was liable to torture without knowing the name of his accuser. The proceedings were secret. The inquisitor pronounced the sentence and the victim was turned over to civil authorities to be imprisoned for life or to be burned. The victim's property was confiscated and divided between the church and the state. That's convenient. <clears throat> the Inquisition claimed vast multitudes of victims in Spain, Italy, Germany, and the Netherlands and did its most deadly work against uh, the Albigenses. You can read about the Albigenses and the Waldensons later, uh, but they're pretty amazing to study. They're, they're the roots of some of the Protestant presence in Italy today. The, um, the, not the Albigenses, but the Waldenses uh, in the northern Italy that still survived. The Albigenses were all wiped out systematically by the, the Pope during the Inquisition. For 500 years, the Inquisition was the most diabolical thing of human history. For its record, none of the subsequent line of, quote, holy and infallible popes have ever apologized. Rather, their leadership and instigators have been elevated to sainthood. Following on, I'm just going to read down so I'm not taking too much time on this. Roman Catholicism became the most persecuting faith the world has ever seen. Innocent III murdered far more Christians in one afternoon than any Roman emperor did in, during his entire reign. In Spain alone, over three million are recorded in Canon Lorente's History of Inquisition. These horrors remain as memorials, memorials to the dogmas which remain in force today. Millions over the centuries were, who simply refused to align themselves with the Roman Catholic heresies, dogmas and practices were martyred for their faith. I'm not a Roman Catholic hater, right? And I don't want to leave this like I somehow hate the Roman Catholics. This is history that leads up to a lot of this. And there are many of our dear brothers and sisters who are in the Roman uh, Catholic Church. So please don't take me as some way this is a Catholic bashing session. It's not. Not meant to be that. But from our history, my point in this is how do we go from sweet, we, think about the Christians in that time of Constantine. We've been brutally murdered and oppressed and uh, torn to pieces, literally in Diocletian. Guys, I don't want to overrun this. The Romans were brutal. And then their torture, they were very symbolic. They were not going to just kill people. They're going to kill them and make an example of them. So they would literally throw Christians into the fire and a burning an altar. If they're not going to sacrifice to the pagan gods, they will become a sacrifice. And, you know, oh, you worship this guy that hang on, hung on a tree. They would bend two trees together, tie him to two legs, and let him go and just rip him apart. These were the horrors and the things that the Romans came up with during that time and the immense pressure that was going on in the church. So don't understate and undervalue the seriousness of the gravity of what our brothers and sisters went through back then. Coming out of that into great peace, how do we get from that? that oh, the, the peace and joy of prosperity in a, in a land and a country that now acknowledges us, legalizes us, and favors us to that to the Inquisition and all kinds of things like that. I would submit that Satan in some ways has never changed tactics and in some ways he has. He twisted, he marries the church to the world, he invites in all this, and then he eventually about a thousand years later goes right back to his original plan for Satan was a murderer from the beginning and he will be a murderer until the day the Lord deals with him ultimately. He's a murderer. And not only does he murder the church through the Inquisition and true believers uh, in this time, but he did so by stamping the name of Christ on it. It was an ultimate blasphemy. It was an ultimate sticking his finger in the face of God to try to, try to twist and corrupt uh, what was, in its own way, could be a good thing, okay? Um, so beware of ease. Sometimes we worry about suffering. We worry about uh, persecution. We worry about, oh, in our time, they're gonna, Christians are going to be the enemy soon in America and all this stuff. We get wrapped around the axle on this stuff. But perhaps the greater danger isn't captivity, it's friendly captivity. It's a captivity in a country, in a world where you're very much so accepted. And that, that friendly captivity is why the Jews in Babylon didn't want to go back to Jerusalem because they were comfortable in their new established thoughts. Many of them were born in Babylon, right? So beware of friendly captivity. All right, this leads us to our application. Anybody have any thoughts before we transition kind of this? Additions, anything I totally uh, messed up historically? Creating 
physical things that stories are for. Yeah, you see the blend of paganism again, right? Images, stuff. And that's that lays the root in a lot of things you see in Roman Catholicism today, even relic worship, Shroud of Turin. And like, where do we see this in history? Remember the bronze serpent that Moses held up in the wilderness that God actually commanded to be built and erected so that the disease would be put to death among the Israelites? They had that hundreds of years later in the days of Hezekiah. If you want a relic, that was a legitimate relic, right? It's one that God instituted and sold and made, and they were worshiping it. They called it Nehushtan, right? Our inclination to latch onto idols and things is so prolific. That's why the Lord so adamantly says, Thou shalt not make for yourself a graven image. And using things like that as some sort of a talisman or a means of worship is perilous at best and is downright idolatrous. Um, on, I'll say it. Yeah. I don't know if you know the answer, but his mother was Christian and thought it was a Roman army officer. Mm-hmm. Were they known? I mean, uh, they were. There was a lot of, you know, married, but they weren't this loving couple like we see in a Hallmark right, movie nowadays. But, yeah, <laughs> um, they were. Uh, but she, I, somebody helped me up with the history. I didn't dig into her nearly as much. But I thought that was odd. She was. She had an influence there, um, but it was from their perspective. It was less of like kind of Augustine's mother, which had a very different kind of influence over Augustine. But they had sort of a Christianese. At least they knew the lingo, and they knew that hmm, with all these gods, I better pray to that god too, kind of a thing to get favor in battle and all that. Um, she was interesting in her own right. I don't know much about her though. I can. Anybody else is willing to talk to that? All right. Application. We got about 15 minutes for this. My first book, what do we take from all this? What's the root of all that? What's wrong with saying this is the, the national, like why would we not as an American nation say we are God's people and this is his country? We are a Christian nation. Because nations don't change hearts. Con- uh, countries and governments do not change hearts. That, the changing of hearts is God's business. That is a miraculous work wrought by the Holy Spirit only, only. This has implications not just for national and government implications, but for me as a parent. I cannot change my children's hearts. I cannot go and legislate for them how they are to be saved. I can tell them. I can take them to God. So my job is not to change their hearts. It's to take them to the only one who can change hearts. Take them to Christ. Show them the gospel. Represent God faithfully to me. And that is the Great Commission, right? To go and witness and to show them these things and then trust the Lord that he will do what is pleasing in his sight and he's good to do so. Um, how does that apply today? So this issue of gods and, and governments, you see this conversation a lot nowadays. And I was debating about whether to go into this much or not. Now I'm going to address a few things here because I think it's worth mentioning because of this. Christian nationalism. Uh, it's a very big topic of discussion and discourse nowadays, this idea of should a nation be Christian or uh, Christian. When people say this, when they say Christian nationalism, they usually refer or mean one of two things. They either mean Christian influence or they mean Christian identity. Um, that's two different, very different things. Some people use the phrase to mean that Christianity should influence the nation and its laws, and others mean the nation and its government should actually identify as Christian. Critics will denounce, like, critics, no matter what you say, even if you're just trying to say Christian influence, a critic is going to call you a Christian nationalist. It's like a pejorative nowadays that label you these things. So it's difficult to kind of get to the heart of what people are actually saying. But if influence is the standard, then I'm a Christian nationalist. Yes. Our Christian principles should govern the way we interact with people and we do things. The government should administer justice the way God defines it, not the way some other God defines it. That is true, right? That God's definition of justice should be the way these things go. Uh, So when I'm referring to, um, when I'm saying be wary of this, um, this topic, I'm not so much talking about influence as I am identity, all right? The identity, like saying we are a Christian nation or Saudi Arabia is a Muslim nation, or China is a communist country. It's an identity kind of piece to it. Uh, The distinguishment, the distinction between an established religion and a non-established religion uh, is not so much like an on-off switch, it's more like a dimmer switch. Um, So it's not like you kind of go immediately from one to the other, which is why there's so much debate nowadays about Turkey. And I was about to, I was gonna play the song at the beginning of class, but I thought better of it. Is it Istanbul or Constantinople? I love that old 90s song, right? (laughs) It just cracks me up every time I listen to it. Is it Istanbul? Is it Constantinople? Is it Byzantine? Is it Byzantium? Uh, it's this debate throughout history because is, is Turkey Christian? Well, if they are, are they Eastern Orthodox? Are they Roman Catholic? Or are they Muslim? Is it Istanbul? All this stuff back and forth. That's why there's debates on all this stuff now. Uh, is India Hindu or is America, uh, is America Christian or was it Christian? Um, right? And all three of those countries, India, Turkey, and America, Uh, They all have secular constitutions, but they all have laws and various other things that clearly favor one religion over another and help one religion over another. If it's even if it's as simple as acknowledging some sort of a calendar with religious implications, y'all like enjoy uh, Christmas? 
Do you like celebrating that and having time off from work for that kind of season? Well, I do. But all of these have some way of favoring that religion over another. So why is this uh, a big deal? When the dimmer switch, in a sense, is all the way up, the state says, this is our God, and we are his people. All right? That's the difference between influence and identity. God very much cares about where he places his name. That's why this is a big deal. God very much cares about where he places his name. In the Old Testament, God identifies himself with the children of Abraham and the nation of Israel. In Exodus 6, you are my people, I am your God. He places his name on them, tying his reputation to them. When the people went into Canaan, they were to remove the names of false gods. In Deuteronomy 12, you shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. And they were, put, and they were to put the Lord's name there in that place. In verse 5, but you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. And as they lived in the land in obedience, and Deuteronomy 28 says, and all the peoples of the earth shall see and that you are called by, my, by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. But what happened, right? What went wrong with Israel? They worshiped other gods. Why was that a big deal? Why was it a big deal that they worshiped other gods? Because it defiled God's name. So he excommunicated them. He sent them into exile in Ezekiel 36. Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned. Where? Among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned. Where? Among the nations. And the nations will know that I am the Lord. How will God do that? He promises a new covenant, right? I will take you, this is in verse 22 of Ezekiel, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land and I will give you a new heart and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules and you shall be my people and I will be your God. So with the new covenant, God no longer ties his name to a geopolitical people, but to his son and then to everyone united in his son, the church. That's where he stamps his name, okay? Now fast forward to the book of Acts. If you ever wanna do something fun, do control F name in the book of Acts, all right? Uh, for all these. I think it's over 36 times that's used in here. I won't read all these. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, 221. 412, Peter and John explain, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 512, high priest after another arrest basically said, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name. Right, the name of Jesus. There's a lot of stuff about the emphasis of Jesus' name. Why this emphasis on his name? It's because ever since the fall, God has always drawn a very clear distinction about between who his people are and who his people are not. These are my people, these are not my people. Okay? Because he unites his name to his people. This is what so many Christians seem to miss in the whole Christian nationalism conversation. Uh, they miss that whole critical part of it. The conversation is not just about moral influence, which again, I say, if it's just about influence, yes, uh, absolutely. But the harder question is, do we really want to identify a nation filled with non-Christians as Christian, right? Do we want to bring in a whole nation of people and stamp, just rubber stamp all this, and yeah, all those Gentile rabble with us as Christian? God is very passionate about where he says his name. The apostles' concern with Christ's name wasn't about, was about authentic identity and witness, the authenticity of the genuineness of bearing the name of Jesus Christ. We are Christians, Christians. We bear the name of Christ, which is why the uh, commandment and the Ten Commandments was, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. It has nothing to do with language. It has everything to do with ambassadorship, that we have the name of Christ and we're able to represent him faithfully. We have a fiduciary relationship, if you will, with God. We are, our role and responsibility is to represent him faithfully to the world. And Jesus is serious about this. God was serious about it in the Old Testament. He excommunicated an entire people and sent them into Babylon because they did not bear his name faithfully. But Barrett bore it falsely. And so he kicked them out, in a sense, and eventually brings us back in through the grace of Christ, which enables us to have a true, genuine relationship with God. That's why it matters. First of all, another consideration is the work of placing God's name on a people is a priestly task. That's not a governmental task. It's a priestly task. To declare this is who God is, and these are the doctrines we believe, and declare these are God's people is to undertake priestly activity. That was in the Old Testament in Israel. That was a priest's job to teach the law, to instruct, and to, by nature of that, as a nation, patrol the boundaries ethically, religiously, and everything of the nation to ensure everyone is believing in Yahweh and worshiping him accordingly. Whereas in the Old Testament, that was with the nation. It is now with the church. God has given that authority to the church 
to establish those who are his and those who are not. That's why we have church discipline. Uh, that's the role of the church. I'm going to quote Jonathan Lehman on this. Uh, he's, he puts this really well. He says, To be sure, any individual can say who he thinks God is. Yet when a group formally undertakes to identify and affirm one another according to a set of doctrines and fidelity to those doctrines, they have undertaken priestly work. That is, they are declaring themselves the official representatives or mediators of those doctrines and the guardians of membership among these people. That's true whether we're talking about priest of Yahweh, Baal, Marduk, or Jesus. The priestly function, that is to say, is an identifying function. It places the name of God or a God in a group and claims that he identifies with them and that they speak for him. By that token, to call on the government of nations today to enforce Christian doctrine about who God is or to formally identify a nation itself as Christian is to claim that God intends for government to exercise a priestly function. Lastly about this, and then we'll uh, skip in. While that priestly function uh, formerly belonged to the, the nation, now belongs to the church. So, um, sorry, one sec. When the state establishes a church and names itself Christian, it participates in that name tag pinning and sign hanging work. It has usurped the keys and acted as a church. It has named people as Christians who are not Christians. This is anti-baptism, anti the Lord's Supper, in a sense. It's also pro-nominalism and therefore missiologically careless. That's why we should care about it. It encourages people to say, it's okay if you don't believe. You know, we see these even modern days in the seeker-friendly movements in the church, right? The whole slogan, belonging before believing kind of a thing. Remember, you hear that a lot in the early 2000s-ish. We just got to get them in, bring them into the church, get them here, and it'll rub off on them, and they'll eventually kind of believe. The problem is, my grandma used to always say this, if you sleep with pigs, you get dirty. They don't get any cleaner, right? <laughs> um, it's the same principle, that we they don't belong before believe. It creates confusion about who you are, and it gives a sense of, like, it's okay if you don't believe. We'll get you there by rubbing off on you. Does it? Huh? Does a, you mean like a cross on a steeple kind of thing? Yeah. Does that identify us as a Christian church? Yes. I would prefer our identity to come from the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart and the way well, we live in a community. Is, is true. But there is a difference between a cross like that and a crucifix. I um, agree with that. Mm -hmm. But a simple cross, in my mind, is not a grave image. Yeah, I'd agree. I'd agree with that. I do. I would say if we worship that cross, or we somehow we're holding little crosses and using them to pray and somehow intellectually. Who do you know that worship the cross? Constantine? <laughs> no, he used it maybe uh, in a, a wrong sense. Mm -hmm. Do you? Why else would he wear it? I think because it can be very... Decoration? It's very good. It can be very socially acceptable to do so. I know a lot of people wear crosses that are probably not Christians. Um, True. I, and that's, that's a really good point, and it's worth diving into this. It would be a good class to actually just discuss about discuss that iconography and should we decorate with those kinds of things. And there's, it's, there is some leeway in there. It's not like I'm saying we should not have any crosses anywhere. But there are things to guard against. Um, so remind me, and I'd love to talk offline about that to you a little bit. Uh, we got one more thing to close with here. We got five more minutes. Um, I don't want to cut you off. I know what you're saying. Um, and I, Alex, you want to pitch in on that at all? Or? I think the big thing that, that you said rightly earlier, and maybe you didn't hear totally, there was a degree of putting trust in the symbol. That is a translation of what worship is. So when we see people wearing symbols of crosses, when you see churches, I mean, I would, I would assume that if there's 100 churches in Beaufort County, they probably all have some symbol of a cross. And yet, it's probably safe to say 10% are preaching the word. So that is idolatry. If you are using a sign to represent God in a way that God has not ordained that he be represented. So to, to hang the cross over the church or whatever it is, is really the same thing Constantine was doing. Looking at it saying, that is our symbol of salvation rather than looking to Jesus himself. Apart from Jesus Christ, the cross was two rough pieces of wood. Hmm. It is very possible to look superstitiously to the cross, which is, I think, what probably is more common today than not. Hmm. 
It's exactly what Kant's team was doing without looking to Jesus himself for salvation. <laughs> and many, many, many people today do that. <laughs> they look as if the cross itself has power. It only has power when the Savior transforms <laughs> it from a, a weapon of shame to <clears throat> the tool of our salvation. <laughs> it very easily becomes an idol. Does that mean everybody that is that has a cross necklace is worshiping it? No, by no means. And, and I don't think that's what you were saying at all. No. no. But it is often abused in the idolatrous hearts of men. Hmm. Well said. He was crucified on a cross of wood, but he made the hill on which it stood. Right? Last two points. Purify your ambassadorship of Christ. And these will be quick. Purify your ambassadorship of Christ. In a world where we do have a lot of luxury and comfort and ease, it's far more easy to want to slip into the direction of idolatry and slip in the direction of worldliness for the sake of comfort. When we're faced with the reality of you will commit heresy or die, in some ways, if you're truly a believer, like, how could I do that? Right? And it can lead to apostasy in that way, don't get me wrong, but it's, historically, the pollution of the church through worldliness was far more damaging than the outright attempt to destroy it through, through, through violence. This week, Sinclair Ferguson was talking on his podcast, and he was talking about this with regards to lust or whatever, but what Satan couldn't do through brute force, he did through twisting and manipulation. He used the Latin phrase, corruptio optimi pessima. That's an old Latin phrase, which means the worst is the corruption of the best. Right? And if he wants to blaspheme God, he's going to take the best and he's going to twist it and manipulate it and convert it into something uh, awful, right? To fight a God. Lastly, our fight is not political, it is spiritual, and thus requires the use of spiritual weapons. If we recognize this, we're not going to go. This, when we understand this, that God changes hearts, not governments, it's going to change the way you talk with people on the streets. It's going to change what you post about on Facebook or what you argue about on social media or what you get emotionally just amped up about. You're going to turn Fox News off a lot more, CNN off a lot more, and what you're going to probably do is hit your knees in prayer, appealing to the God who really truly can change hearts and change nations. They overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. I'm going to close with this quote from C.S. Lewis from the Screwtape Letters. I love this quote. My dear Wormwood, be sure that the patient remains completely fixated on politics. Arguments, political gossip, and obsessing on the faults of people they have never met serves as an excellent distraction from advancing in personal virtue, character, and the things the patient can control. Make sure to keep the patient in a constant state of angst, frustration, and general disdain towards the rest of the human race in order to avoid any kind of charity or inner peace from further developing. Ensure that the patient continues to believe that the problem is out there and the broken system rather than recognizing there's a problem with himself. Keep up the good work, Uncle Screwtape. All right. Any closing thoughts, comments? I got, I got one closing yeah. thought. Uh, one of the things that, that's really prominent in, in America today is uh, uh, nationalism or patriotism. And it, it was in Britain, uh, it's in most, most of it. Uh, but now we're, I'm at this point in my life where I'm trying to uh, apply you know, Christianity. And I'm noticing that there is a drive in me for personal self-defense, national defense, uh, taking up violence against uh, some form of uh, enemy, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be somebody at the grocery store or a foreign nation or, or whatever. I did. But I don't, I don't see that as a um, as Christ's way. I see more of, of like what we're saying about um, it's not passiveness and it's more of a uh, influential thing, but it's trust. It's not trust in the empire of, of the nation. It's a trust in the peace of God. Mm. And when it comes to applying it to our lives, uh, I have a struggle, uh, a deep struggle, uh, of not being able mm. to uh, reconcile those two. Yeah. So I just, I just to That's a huge can of worms to open up. I've got a great resource for you. C.S. Lewis, actually, guy I just quoted. Uh, go read his essay called uh, Why I'm Not a Pacifist. Great resource on that. And one of the quotes I love from that is he said, we have discovered that the scheme of outlawing war has made war more of an outlaw without making it any less frequent. And that to banish, this, the, to, and to banish the night does not alleviate the suffering of the peasant. So there's more to it. I'm a Marine. And like, listen, this is near and dear to my heart too, and where we do all that. And this is worth a lot of good discussion on that. Uh, we don't have time for it here, but if you want to, will you raise your hand? Yeah, I was just yeah. going to say we need to wrap up. Yeah, this. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Great point. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for history. Thank you that we serve the one true God who has control over all history. We love you. Keep us until the end faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.